This is the Mediterranean Sea. Studded with islands, the sea is surrounded by rocky hillsides and most of the coast is made of limestone. Over several centuries, people staying here have transformed the region and in the process, shrublands that exist today were created. The greatest concentration of tourism on planet Earth occurs in the Mediterranean region with more than 100 million tourists visiting the region every year. The Algarve stretch of coast is popular with tourists and also is an important habitat for cork oaks and migrating birds. The Balearic Islands are a combination of wild coasts covered with shrublands and beaches. Lined with high-rise hotels, they serve as tourist spots. Thera or Santorini was a center of the ancient Minoan civilization. Almost 3,500 years ago, a volcanic eruption nearly destroyed this island. The Mediterranean shrubland has a great variety of birds that have made it their home. The hoopoe is one of the most eye-catching birds of this shrubland. It has a fan-shaped crest and black and white wings that instantly attract the eye. A large number of hoopoes spend the winter in Africa and migrate to southern Europe in the spring. Shrubby woodland and olive groves are the best place for them to breed. They feed on insects by probing into the earth with their long curved beaks. These birds nest in holes either in trees or in the ground. The hoopoes are famous for their unhygienic habits. They have the habit of never cleaning their nests and have a strong smell which probably helps deter other animals from attacking them. Shrublands are ideal places for animals to find food. There are a lot of meat eaters here but the animals that have the greatest impact on plants here are vegetarians. These vegetarian animals are a vital part of the shrubland because they in turn become the food for predators and scavengers. The plants of the shrubland are either tough or full of oils that make it difficult for the people to digest. But for the plant eaters of shrubland, it is not so difficult because they have special equipment to tackle such kind of food. The largest shrubland plant eaters are antelopes and deers. These hoofed animals are ruminants just like cows. Ruminants are animals that have a complicated digestive system which can deal with the plants of the shrublands. Unlike other animals, they have four stomachs. The biggest of the four is called the rumen. It is packed with millions of microorganisms bathed in saliva. These microorganisms have to earn their share of food by releasing chemicals that break down chewed up leaves. After breaking down the leaves, the microorganisms get a small share while the major share goes to the host. Ruminants feeding on shrubs need tough teeth to tear off and chew their food. These animals bring up the food they have swallowed and chew it the second time to make sure that the microorganisms can do a thorough job. This is called ruminating or chewing the cud. Cattle are also ruminants and chew their food lying down. But antelopes and deer chew the cud standing because they live in a dangerous environment. In this way, they are ready to make a quick escape if a predator attacks. Not all antelopes live on grassy plains of Africa. Many of them live in shrubland as there is more cover from prying eyes. The females find more places in the shrublands to conceal their newborn calves. In grassland, antelopes live in herds for their safety, while in shrubland, as it is easier to hide from predators, antelopes often live in family groups. Since shrubland can be a difficult place to move through, many antelopes are small in size. The smallest of them is Kirk's Dick Dick and weighs as little as 3 kilograms. This miniature antelope is found in eastern Africa and its slender shape allows it to dash through densest thickets. As it runs, it makes a sharp dick dick cry and warns its relatives that danger is nearby. The Gerenuk antelope browses thorny shrubs in Ethiopia, Somalia and northern Kenya. It can stand on its hind legs for a long time. 
as it chews upon the most nutritious morsels it can find. Most shrubland antelopes live in tropics, while deer live in cooler parts of the world. Deer appear similar to antelopes, but it is easy to differentiate between them. Male deer grows antlers, while both sexes of antelope have horns. The horns of antelopes are made up of keratin. It is the same material from which hair and fingernails are formed. On the other hand, deer's antlers are made of bone. They fall off and regrow each year. There is more bone in a single antler than in a whole human arm. Shrubland is home to more than a dozen kind of deer. The biggest deer is the North American mule deer. Its antlers have lots of prongs and can measure four feet from tip to tip. Even though it is big in size, it does not give itself away and moves quietly. The main predator of the mule deer is the mountain lion. It is efficient and deadly, so the mule deer has to be secretive. An adult mountain lion can eat a fully grown mule deer every two weeks, while during breeding season, a female mountain lion having cubs can kill a deer every three days. Despite this danger from the mountain lion, mule deer are very successful animals and the credit goes partly to their flexible diet. While they survive by eating a variety of different plants, when it is hard to find leaves, they can survive by eating twigs and barks. These are high fiber food but having the microorganisms inside them, deer can break it down. While deer can eat any kind of plant, there are small plant eaters of shrubland that are very choosy in what they eat. This is the caterpillar of the two-tailed Pasha butterfly. It feeds only on the leaves of the strawberry tree growing around the Mediterranean Sea. The name of the tree may sound tasty, but this little tree has favorless fruits. The leaves of this tree taste even worse. Majority of the animals avoid the leaves, but the Pasha caterpillars eat nothing else. Concentrating on this undesirable food, the Pasha caterpillars have all the food to themselves. The red fruit also becomes a valuable source of food for the birds in winter. This is the Marley shrublands of Australia. It has a unique mixture of animals that can only survive in the shrublands and cannot live in the nearby desert. Bandicoots are small marsupials that use the dense cover of the shrubland to hide from its predators. Another marsupial called the numbats eat ants and forage in dead wood for ants and termites. The dead wood and leaf litter that build up in the Mali shrublands are used by legless lizards and snakes as hiding place and hunting ground. But these animals have to face a challenge for their survival. The climate of shrubland is ideal for farming and much of the land has been cleared for the same purpose. The most affected of the animals is the western swamp tortoise. It has not only lost its habitat, it is now being hunted by cats and foxes. Bushfires triggered by people have also resulted in the death of many of these tortoises. The surviving 300 tortoise live in a patch of habitat near Perth. Come summer, an Australia's bush brings an unwelcome insect, the bushfly. The bushfly is small in size and does not bite, but it has a strong liking for the moisture and salt on human skin. As soon as it finds a human, it settles on their faces and even crawls into their nostrils and ears. The life of bushfly starts as maggots in animal droppings and then transforms into adult flies in the soil. As the fly season reaches its pinnacle, clouds of them fill the air. There is only one way to keep them away and that is by wearing hat with net or with cocks or strings. As dusk falls in shrubland, it is time for crickets and katydids to begin their noisy chorus, thus signaling the start of the night shift. In shrublands, most plant-eating insects avoid the daylight and feed under the cover of darkness. But grasshoppers are good at jumping away as danger strikes, so they risk feeding during the day. The plant-eating insects feeding at night are relatives of grasshoppers having similar shape, long body, 
tough jaws and strong legs. They also have a similar way of calling out. Like the grasshoppers, they too scrap the parts of their bodies together while calling out. Many of the insects are so well camouflaged that even in bright flashlight they are difficult to find. Crickets and catidids are not purely vegetarian and have a liking for animal food. So not surprisingly, they may be seen munching on an insect instead of leaves or flowers. With so many insects inhabiting the shrubland, it becomes an ideal hunting ground for insect eaters. Birds, lizards, spiders, centipedes, as well as insects themselves from the family of hunters hunting the insects. Crickets and catidids are only part-time hunters compared to assassin bugs and praying mantises that never touch plant food. They even have different ways of dealing with their prey. An assassin bug stabs its prey and then sucks the juices of its victim through its syringe-like mouth. After sucking the entire juice, the assassin bug drops the dead body. In contrast, some young assassin bug stacks the dried out bodies of its victim on its back to serve as a camouflage. This disguises the young assassin bug from its prey. The praying mantis is different and does a clean job by eating the whole corpse of its victim. These are chameleons. They are peculiar animals that are famous for changing their body color. Unlike other lizards that hunt on the ground, chameleons stalk their prey in shrubs and trees. Found in Africa and Southern Asia, these lizards have a unique way of attacking their prey. They creep quietly along branches, gripping them with their toes and tails. Their eyes protrude and can revolve independently, allowing them to see in two different directions at the same time. As soon as it spots an insect, it slows down and starts moving at the pace of a snail. As soon as the insect comes in the attacking range, the chameleon shoots out its tongue and within seconds hauls its prey inside its mouth. The tongue of the chameleon can be as long as its body and has a sticky tip that ensures no escape of the victim. Most of the chameleons do not change color for camouflage but to communicate with other chameleons. These chameleons are good at camouflage but in shrubland the best disguises are done by birds. This is the common nightjar of Europe. It spends the daytime resting on the ground. Its mottled brown feathers make it appear like a fallen branch. As soon as the sun sets, as if by magic, the branch comes to life and flies away. The nightjar may have a short beak, but it has a very wide mouth that is fringed with feathery bristles. The mouth serves a life funnel that catches moths and other flying insects after dark. This is the tawny frogmouth, another nocturnal bird found in the Australian bush. During daytime, this tawny frogmouth sits upright with its eyes almost closed, making it appear a piece of dead wood. But as soon as anything comes too close, it suddenly opens its mouth, revealing bright pink skin inside and frightens the intruder away. In this manner, the frogmouth escapes from becoming any intruder's meal. In comparison with leaves, seeds are storehouse of energy. These are easily digestible and can also easily be stored. This is the reason why the shrubland is home to many seed eaters even though seeds are sometimes difficult to find. The real experts of this kind of lifestyle are rodents because they are well equipped for carrying their food back home. These rodents have a built-in cheek pouches that have the capacity to stretch like a shopping bag when filled with seeds. The interesting thing is that these pouches can be closed off from the rest of the mouth. This allows the rodent to eat or drink even when its pouch is full. Hamsters and American pocket mice have some of the largest pouches of all, allowing them to carry hundreds of small seeds at one time. Many of the shrubland rodents are good climbers, but most of them prefer to collect the seeds that have fallen on the ground. Summer is the ideal time for their harvest, but they are capable of turning up seeds at other times as well by doing some careful searching. 
This pocket mice found in the chaparral of California in the USA finds the seeds by sifting the soil with its front paws. They have long front paws that help them sort seeds from the soil. As soon as the pocket mouse collects a paw full of seeds, it transfers them to its cheek pouch and heads back to its home. While collecting seeds, the rodents have to be careful of their predators. So they collect seeds only during the night when there is less chance of being attacked. Like rodents, seed-eating birds too have made shrubland their home. These seed-eating birds use daytime to search for their food as it is not possible for them to see after dark. If these birds feel threatened, then they take off only as a last resort. This is Tinamus, found in South American scrub. On feeling threatened, these chicken-sized birds run for cover and then suddenly freeze. This makes them hard to see. Even after this, if they feel threatened, then they take emergency action and burst into the air on their stubby wings. But being exposed in the air for a long time is again dangerous for them, so they don't fly far. Once they drop back into the scrub, they instantly disappear from sight. Many seed-eating birds throughout the world's shrubland behave in similar manner, but the biggest seed-eaters cannot fly at all because their wings are far too small to allow them to fly. The rhea of South America and emus of Australia belong to the family of flightless giants. The African ostrich also wanders into the shrublands occasionally, although it prefers the grassy plains. Although these birds are not able to fly, they manage to find food because of their extremely good eyesight. They have long necks and can see above the vegetation for any danger. Within seconds of sensing the danger, they run on their marathon runner legs and are capable of running for 20 to 30 minutes at a stretch. This time duration is enough to give their enemies the slip. Other than swallowing seeds, these seed-eating birds can even gulp down insects and sometimes even stones. These stones lodge themselves into a muscular chamber in front of the bird's stomach called the crop. The stones here help in grinding the food so it is easier to digest. Birds do not have the capability to tell the difference between stones and other hard objects lying on the ground. So it is often seen that ostriches swallow coins, bottle caps and even car keys if they find it lying on the ground. Shrubland is also the ideal habitat for snakes. So people planning to take a walk in the shrubland should wear thick ankle-high boots and should watch where they are putting their feet and hands. Most shrubland snakes are harmless to people and slither away the moment they sense that human feet are approaching. This they do by detecting the vibrations that travel through the soil. In tropical shrubland, some snakes live off the ground, so they find it difficult to sense approaching human beings. This is the brown wine snake found across southwestern USA to Brazil. It is one of the most remarkable climbers and grows up to 5 feet long. It has a slender body and pointed snout that makes it appear like the stem of a climbing plant. This disguise of the snake fools one of its favorite preys, the lizards as well as the humans. The snake makes its camouflage even more effective by spending most of its time keeping absolutely still. If someone comes dangerously close, it uses the trick used by the tawny frogmouth and opens its mouth wide in the hope of frightening the intruder away. The brown wine snake, even though is poisonous, its poison does little harm to humans. The same cannot be said about this most feared of North American snakes, the rattlesnake. This is the red diamond rattlesnake. It is a chaparral specialist and has long hinged fangs that it uses to inject venom into its prey. Australia's shrubland has snakes with potent venom, but as far as people are concerned, the most dangerous of all shrubland snakes is the black mamba. It is an African species and is an amazingly rapid climber. When on ground, it can move even quicker. It grows up to 15 feet long and can move at a speed of 20 kilometers per hour, a speed that can outrun a child. 
small mammals and birds are its prey and its venom can even kill people. The top predators of any biome are the hunters that have nothing to fear except for the human beings and the changes that the human beings bring to the biome. Leopard is the top predator of the shrublands of Africa. But in Australia and few islands of Indonesia, the top shrubland predators are not big cats or snakes, but giant lizards. These lizards belong to the family called the monitors. The largest shrubland variety found in Australia is the lace monitor. It grows up to 6 feet long and has powerful legs that make it a good climber. The sharp claws make it easy for the lizard to rip apart its prey. But in the forest and scrub of Indonesia is found the largest monitor lizard called the Komodo dragons. The heaviest of the Komodo dragons can weigh double the weight of an adult human being and measures 10 feet from head to tail. The Komodo dragons can feed on anything that they find. Their food ranges from live deer and snakes to dead remains of the animals. Having keen sense of smell, they can track down carcasses from a distance of 5 kilometers. These adult Komodo dragons behave as cannibals and often the little ones end up being the meal of the adults. But once fully grown, they can expect to live for about 40 years. The Komodo dragon has such a strong bite that it can kill its prey in just one bite. Bacteria in the lizard's saliva infect the victim's wound and cripples it. This is the South Africa's Cape region. It is small in size and covers less than a thousand of the world's land surface. But interestingly, it is home to more than 8,000 species of plants. Its shrubland, called the Finbos, contains almost as many types of flowering plants as the whole of Europe. Due to the richness and distinctiveness of the Finbos plants, scientists have classified the Cape region as one of the world's six floral kingdoms. The plants found in Finbos are tough and unappetizing. Only a few of the large mammals live on these plants like this Cape Mountain Zebra. If one is used to living in cities, shrublands might not appear an ideal place to live and set up a home. But shrublands are full of lot many things that people need to live like the year-round supply of food. Today, it is very difficult to imagine people living by hunting and gathering the lifestyle that is considered to be humanity's oldest. But there are people who still live on wild food and are known as hunter-gatherers. Hunter-gatherers were the only people that lived in the chaparral in the mid-1500 when Europeans first landed in California. They never grew crops or raised animals, but interestingly, they never felt short of food. In the 1770s, Spanish missionaries arrived from Mexico and things changed for the hunter-gatherers. These Europeans established farms and the hunter-gatherers for the first time experienced the settled way of life. Then, in 1848, an event occurred that changes California forever. In the year 1848, gold was discovered in central California. In a span of one year, thousands of prospectors arrived climbing over the mountains and through sea route after the dangerous passage around the southern tip of South America. The arrivals were not just miners, but traders and other related arrivals, all eager to cash on what became to be known as the gold rush. This gold rush was short-lived, but it permanently changed the face of California. By 1900s, town, roads and farms were spreading all over California and maximum number of hunter-gatherers had disappeared. On the other side of the Pacific, in Australia, like California's hunter-gatherers, Aboriginal people lived entirely on wild food and lead a nomadic life traveling hundreds of kilometers in one year. Early Aboriginals were experts and developed ways of getting sufficient food from land. During dry weather, they set fire to dead plants. This encouraged fresh growth and attracted birds and other animals. This in turn made hunting more successful. As the generations passed, this burning effect had an impact on Australia's plant life. 
the fire created an open space, giving an opportunity to species like Marlies to take root. A deliberate patchwork of shrubland and grassland was created that even exists today. The kangaroos are difficult to control. Maybe that was the reason why Australia's aboriginals never raised these animals for food. But this was not the cause with Mediterranean region. Here, shrubland people had most valuable animals at their doorstep like sheep and goats. These animals have instinct of sticking together in herds. Gradually, people learn to manage the herds and to obtain a constant supply of meat, milk and wool for making clothes. These sheep wandered around the landscape guarded by the shepherds and nibbled plants with their extra tough teeth. With the multiplication of these animals, the plants started to disappear and the Mediterranean shrubland slowly changed and also spread to occupy land formerly covered by trees. The concept of herding sheep and goats in Europe and Middle East is more than 10,000 years old. But this was not the only reason that changed the shrubland landscape. People also collected plant food that included edible seeds from the wild grasses. The beginning of cereal farming started when people of the Middle East discovered that it was better to grow these grasses themselves so that they could harvest the seeds more efficiently. This way of life has had a tremendous effect on shrublands. Wheat and corn are the examples of seed that humans learn to grow and harvest from the shrubland plants. Corn has become the third most important cereal in the world after wheat and rice. One disadvantage that corn has is its husks prevents its seeds from scattering. So if people stop planting corn, it would die out. Other than these cereals, olives and grapes are also very much at home in shrubland regions. The olive tree lived in the Mediterranean region and during Roman's reign, its oil was used for lightning as well as cooking because it burns with a smoky yellow flame. The Caucasus Mountains to the east of Black Sea is home to the grapevine. When it was brought to Europe is still a mystery, but once it arrived, it became a feature of the landscape as more and more farmers started making wine. Farms in shrublands have forced the wildlife to either retreat or become extinct. For animals like crows and coyotes, there is always extra food in the farms, but for the other shrubland animals, survival became a challenge and their numbers declined. This is the southwest Australia. It is like an island isolated from the rest of the continent by deserts. The flat and sandy soil is home to an incredible variety of shrubs. These shrubs grow nowhere else in the world. In the beginning of spring, Southwest Australia witnesses one of the greatest natural flower shows. Other than many bizarre and colorful plants, one of the most spectacular plants is the Australian Christmas tree covered in intense yellow flowers from December to January. Just as other biomes face the challenge, the future of shrubland is also not great. The world's remaining shrublands face a fight for survival with pressure from people increasing time and again. But saving shrubland is not considered urgent or appealing like other biomes. These are the pockets of heathland, areas covered by low shrubs in the northwest Europe. They still survive from Stone Age times. Today, they face a new danger from the rapid spread of houses and roads. In Western Australia, huge areas of natural shrublands have been cleared by the farmers. But strips of shrubland can be seen along the state's main highways. These strips have become important wildlife corridors despite the passing traffic. In certain parts of the globe, Shrublands are also being threatened by the introduction of new animals brought by people from outside. The animals that have had worst impact are the goats, cats, foxes and rats. These animals harm native animals and plants by eating them and by competing with them for food. They even tend to spread disease. Climate change can be one of the biggest problems for shrublands. It can cause Africa's shrublands to become more lush and the long dry season might become a thing of the past. But shrubland plants and animals have learned to adjust to the changing climates even though plants take longer to adjust. The question that arises is, 
How will the world's shrublands fare over the next century? The answer is, shrublands will be a part of the planet Earth, but they might not stay in exactly the same place they are now. Some of the shrubland plants and animals may lose in the struggle to cope with the climate change and may permanently disappear. On the other hand, others may benefit and blossom. Most importantly, there will be other changes that will involve us humans. Experts predict that the population of Earth will keep increasing dramatically until 2050 or 2070 and then the population will either be steady or even fall. This will help to decrease the pressure of human population on the shrubland. It will in turn help to protect the shrublands allowing us humans to appreciate the remarkable shrubland plants and animals even more. But today, the key areas of the shrublands can be protected by promoting them as tourist attractions. The money collected from the tourists will pay for the management and protection of the preserved land. Thousands of people flock to South Africa and Western Australia to see the spectacular shrublands. Instead of waiting nature to take its course, we must come forward in preserving the shrubland biome so that the balance is maintained and Earth becomes a better place to live on.